what I'll say is that uh, I'll review the siting considerations. Then the main point really is whatever you do depends on what the question is. So uh, you, we need to know what our science question is that we're trying to uh, answer. Then I'll talk about trench excavation, then preparing the trench, logging the trench, reviewing the trench. So we know it's going to be buried again. So it's important that other people witness what's there so that there's some collective memory. And then a little bit about presentation of the trench log. And again, much of this comes from the McAlpin Pillar Technology book. So I chose to show this work, this generic flowchart yesterday. But, uh, and so we talked, we talked a lot about mapping and we talked about siting. So now we're down here in, in determining the layout and excavating and trenching and a little bit of interpretation, but mostly we're just in this part of the flowchart still. So as I mentioned before, the, the two main purposes for trenching would be to determine paleo earthquake displacement. So it's usually along a narrow zone, so we can simply figure out what happened. But then we may also do earthquake recurrence, which is timing when did the earthquakes occur. And then often we want a wide fault zone so we can see distributed, distributed cracking and really get a good sense of how the ground looked right after the earthquake and how it varied. So we consider the diversity of sedimentary units, as I talked about yesterday. We worry about soil, soil development bioturbation that may obscure what we're looking for. There's a think about how deep we want to go. And then it's important, we always want to think that once you dig, it's destroyed. And so you have to be careful and thoughtful. So in terms of trench locations, which are we doing? Displacement or timing? Uh, what do we expect based on the geomorphology of the site in terms of what the stratigraphy would look like? So remember my example yesterday of gravel and silts. Uh, once we've decided where to put the trench, then that really defines what we'll see. So in other words, if we're cutting the fault uh, perpendicularly, then we expect to see uh, high angle structures cutting through the, the trench and then our sedimentary units hopefully are, are uh, pretty flat across there. But if we cut parallel to the fault zone, if we're right in the fault, all we do is just dig up the fault. There's no fault to see. Or if we're on either side of the fault, we may not see any fractures. So the 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 decision of trenching, trench location is a critical one, and it kind of defines what we'll get out of it. And then do we need to go deep or uh, or just shallow? So here's the, the kinds of trenches that are, are kind of trench design. It depends a little bit on the target. What are we doing? Is it a shallow one? Maybe we can just dig by hand on the slot trench, or we need to go really deep. <clears throat> It also depends on the conditions, if it's a flat place, or if you're digging up a scarp, or, and also if it's really wet, then you need probably a wider one so it can be safe. So you see, the, uh, the this just shows for a, a, a disflip fault, usually you can only dig so deep, you kind of parallel the ground surface, you may have the maximum depth right around where the fault is, and they will go out away. This ramp just means that's a ramp so you can walk out of the, the trench. So this would be a, the kind of profile of the, the trench. And then here's the different styles of cross-sections. So this is the slot trench, or they call California style. So it's a kind of use. It's, it's good because it's minimum damage. Usually can be pretty deep. And usually the machine would be a backhoe. It's usually a cheaper um, machine to rent and that backhoe or trackhoe. Other ones are these laid back ones and you can lay back one side or both sides. So this is something you might do if you're going deep in a place where you can't use hydraulic shoring for safety. Um, and then another thing that you can do to go deep is this benching. So you go down some distance so you get one wall you can interpret. Then we cut down again and this may be a, uh, it may be technically required for the excavation, but it may it's also for safety because you you really want to for safety have a kind of a, a one to one ratio for an unshored trench. So if you go down two meters, it's safest if it's two meters wide because that way if it fails, if the wall fails, and you're in there, 
you know, maybe the material is only to your legs and you can climb out. But if it's really deep, then if it fails, then and you're in there, you're buried in it. Uh, so we want to always be careful. Uh, it, you know, this kind of excavation work is done by many civil engineering activities for site evaluation, and this is uh, so there's many there, and that's where you hear about many accidents that people are buried in trenches. So, you know, so far we haven't had problems for geologists, but we want to always be safety sensitive. So let's. So the next series of slides is just some different styles of trenching examples. So here's the California style, these narrow ones. These are three, four meters deep. They have these hydraulic shores I talked about. So these are, there's oil inside there. You see this connected hose. So you pump it up and so it pushes the two uh, feet of the, the shore of the jack against the wall. And you can put a lot of force and that keeps the wall there, safe. And then you see the spacing is about two meters between each one of those shores. The other thing that you can see about this design is that the trenches are linked. I mentioned this yesterday. You see this trench comes along and then it connects to this one. So we can follow the stratigraphy all the way around. This is really nice to track a single unit with context. The other thing you can see on this far end is the, the ramp. So we can walk out that side. And then we have some, this wood is mostly just for shade to keep the people cool, but also to have better light because sometimes you don't want to have direct sunlight on the wall, but more of a reflected light to be the best uh, view of what's happening. So here's a bench trench that was uh, cut by a big machine down on, on in the middle, and then the last cut was from a, an excavator narrow machine. So this is a normal fall in New Mexico, near where I grew up. Here's a huge one. So look at this big machine. Uh, and they dug it. It was the excavation alone was $100,000. And uh, 1995, so it's like now like 250000 probably or something, right? But they had this question of this, this ground fissure, so some kind of a crack near to a critical site. Uh, was just a commercial development, and so they 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 had, probably had a huge argument. You know, is it an active fault or is it something else? And so they dug and dug and dug, and they decided that it was not related to active fault, uh, but rather some old hot spring vent. So very expensive, but that way they got a confident answer. So this is maybe an extreme. Here's Japanese. I've showed this a few times. I really love these maps. But you see they had a trench site here on this place. It's called Ueno in Miyoshi City along the Mino Fault. And here's the trench. So you see the, the fault zone. So this is a kind of a pit style trench where it's really just a pit with laid back walls in a single point on the fault zone. But they can go deep. So this is as you can see here, it's probably a dip slip, kind of oblique slip, so right dextral, but you see it's against this mountain range, so the mountain range is coming up. So they need to see something about the vertical motion, so they need to go deep. So here's also some, uh, there's Tom Rockwell. So some uh, people, this is uh, Bob Yates, I know this, Bill Ellsworth. This is, um, what's his name, Shmulek Marco, Heidi Stenner. Chesley Williams. So there's some there's some field trip uh, international seismology people going to the site. Same one that I just showed the location of. So you see the fault zone pretty clearly here. Two different rock types and then some kind of a gouge zone of uh, some gravel that's been sheared into the fault zone. So here was a, this is like a map view from above of the, the logs of this trench. And uh, Ganesha and I were discussing yesterday with Mujer, we thought this looks kind of strange, but it actually is very helpful. You get a sense of the three-dimensionality of the, the relationships in the trench. So you see it's very complex fault zone, multiple fault traces, offsetting the layers, different amounts. Here's this big block of gravel that's sheared into place. Uh, and then on this side, sort of more simple, unfaulted, 
layers uh, against that shear zone. And then you see up here at the top is the unconformity that is defining probably one of the last earthquakes. And so you see this FL11 or I guess F11, this fault zone stops right there and has unconformity above it. And so then they dated a bunch of layers in there about 1000 AD. So that earthquake we would interpret was prior to 1000 AD. And so then it looks like there's another, maybe another event horizon here that's a little bit deeper. So on. So as I said, I don't want to go too much into the details of interpretation now. We'll do that in the coming lectures. But you see what, what you do. So, you know, this is what you see. And then you have to get to here, which is the presentation of the final log. So how do we do that? That's the subject of this lecture. So here's another, this is not a very good picture. This is from the McAlpin book. Same kind of Japanese style pit, 13 meters deep. And they can do some things like, here's the Trent map of the site with this trench, this kind of this big pit on the fault zone. Once you have all the logging, then you can do like a profile across it. So you see A to B. So you see it's a reverse fault setting, probably oblique reverse strike split. And then here's this kind of map view of the trench which you see that reverse fault pattern there with the A side being pushed up over B and we're looking at hopefully some detail of the prior earthquake preserved in this collusion in front of the fault So that's Japanese style. Any questions? So here's a big one from Venezuela. So you see this 90 meters long, 8 meters deep and eight meters, uh, eight meters deep and then four, eight meters wide at the top to four meters at the bottom. So this is a, this is a huge trench and they tried to, so one pump, the left side truck is sucking the water out to keep it dry. And the right side truck, they were spraying water on the wall to try to make the layers be more evident. So putting the light, use light water coating. That can be a good idea. So here's one. This one is a complex one where it's a series of trenches that then we stack up. So you see it's called a series of half trenches. And so just look at the bottom here. You see there's fault here. Then we go trench four, trench three, trench two, trench one. And so when they presented it, they, they basically just stack all these cross sections up on top of each other to make the composite. And so the, the usefulness of this is it's a very big, the 20 meter high composite log of this uh, fault zone. And that means that each one of the trenches only needs to be about five meters high. So this is a, a kind of a creative way how to build a big exposure. And also in a maybe somewhat natural setting. So they're, they're in a river channel and so they can have the river kind of do the main excavation, and then they're just modifying the side of the river. Does everyone see that one? That's a little bit more of a complex approach, but maybe clever one at the same time. Okay, what about this one? Oh, this one is a Japanese style geo -flight. So you know in Japan, like many places, you have a minimum damage. We don't want to cause a lot of damage. And uh, there's usually lots of equipment that's convenient, and it's often wet soil, wet material. So what they do is they, uh, this thing's called a geo slicer. So it's uh, basically, it, it, it's maybe two meters wide. Uh, you, well, let's see, it looks like a meter and a half wide and maybe two and a half meters tall piece of metal. And it has, and then it has maybe uh, about 10 centimeter width. And so you can, as you push it down, you can cut, a, you slice a piece of the subsurface out that's about 10 meters wide. And maybe the way to do it is you push it down with, and it's open on one side, and then you push the other face on, down on this side, and they use this, uh, the vibrator on that head there, so it's pounding it down like this. So we put down the side, 
and then then I'll put the other side down, do, 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 and I get this kind of a wedge of material like this, and then I pull the whole thing up and I capture the slice. And so here's maybe what it looks like. So you see this guy here, and you see these slices. So it's been used a lot in tsunami work. And I'll show you in a moment, and then if it doesn't deform the material too much, then you see you can start to interpret the layers. And the nice thing is you can take it back to the office and you can say, here you go, well, there's a, you know, an earthquake right here in the parking lot. Or, uh, and, or in this case, this was a tsunami record from Southern Curial. And, uh, this is not, uh, not my work. I, I just found it, but they, it's a large oriented peel sample from the geo slicer. So what that means is, is once you take the sample, you pull it up, and then you can put some epoxy or silicone and you can glue the sample together to make it strong. And then they take it to the x-ray and you x-ray it. And so then you can see the different densities of the material. And so you can see the current ripples, you see the dark is where the plants were, another current ripple, so kind of more sandy, more. So this is interpreted as a series of, uh, of tsunami flow events in the coastal setting in the Kiril. So this is a quite useful tool under the conditions where it's pretty soft material and fine grain. Okay, so next, now let's, we're digging the trench, so as I showed yesterday, you need a shovel many times, other big equipment. Uh, so here's just an example from a trench. So next, mostly some pictures from some sites where we were working. So these are uh, Carrizo Plain. You see, as the machine is digging, we're putting the hydraulic shores in at the same time because we... Often as we dig, that is the weakest time because the machine's vibrating the ground and it can may immediately fail. And so that's why as soon as it's safe to be, you know, as soon as the machine moves a little bit, then we put the jacks in to save the, the trench. So you see, this is shows maybe also a better view of what the jacks look like. So now the jacks are going in. You see the guys are putting the, the tip of the hose onto the jack and then Somebody's over here is going to pump. Somewhere's a pump behind his foot right here. Oh, they're holding, uh, holding. Who is this, Sinan? Oh, uh, oh, Kathy? Wow. Okay, so that's just some um, excavation stuff. So what do you do once it's open? We clean the walls. We say, be careful. As you're cleaning, you're also doing an initial review of the geology. What are the main units? What are we seeing? What's going on? We're always looking for datable material because sometimes as you're cleaning, you know, there's a beautiful sample and you're, you go, oh, that's it. That was the only one. So you have to be careful, you know, as you're going, okay, looking for datable material. Then once we clean it, then we grid it, mosaic it, that we, we make a photo mosaic. Uh, of the, the wall, and we may do, we need to set up a 3D site survey. So here's the tools we use for cleaning the walls, just different gardening tools mostly to clean and uh, interact with the material. You see slicers, hammers, brushes, Japanese najirigama, sometimes a little water uh, to kind of change the wetness of the material. So here's uh, Gayatri's uh, former advisor, Tom Rockley, cleaning. And you notice, you see this flagging right here. So they probably saw some radio car, some charcoal as they were cleaning. So even before they logged, they, they leave it there and they put a little nail with some flagging to mark it. So then later on, they'll come and collect. So here now there's some... Um, uh, the trench is dug. We see some channels that may be of interest for a displacement survey. Here, the guys are cleaning. You see they're doing very fine tools. Like this is a tool that originally would be for working clay if you're a, a sculptor, a ceramicist. But also you see the brush. She's using a brush. 
computer now is uh, the team is putting the grid on, and so there you see the level. So we want to have you know the point of the grid is reference frame, so always horizontal lines are actually horizontal, vertical are ver actually vertical. So we use the level carpenter's level. Here's the grid and cleaning John on this trench here, so you see very nice, ready to work. It's like our office. Go in there and work, and you may spend two weeks in the trench like this. So uh, it needs to be ready, you know, ready to go. So it's important to have three-dimensional control for the site. So you see here, uh, David, one of the students who has worked with with us, he has the total station there, and he's shooting over to a reflector and a rod person here. So we we're documenting the three-dimensionality of the site. So where the trenches are, where the key geomorphic features are, where the grid is. So I'll show that now. You see, here's a little reflector, and I'm marking the grid with some offset constant amount here. And so that way we have 3D location of the grid because we may want to compare one trench to the other that's far away. So one other device that we found that's useful, not so much for the grid, but you see this blower. So this is a air blower with a motor. Sometimes it's going to be very helpful to clean the wall, kind of compress air. So also in this picture is a terrestrial laser scanner right here. So we're laser scanning the walls, and I'll show this more in a moment. But uh, that's what's going on. That's what these targets are for the laser scanner to... Uh, to find in the point cloud, but then the total station is being used to locate the control points so that we have a global coordinate system for everything. So here's the hydraulic shoring in the trench with, and you see now again my sketch, uh, they're showing the pressurized, these pressurized jacks pushing against the wall for safety and then the grid between them. So here now we're ready to take pictures. So we take pictures of the wall. This person's there to shade the camera so there's no light on the camera. And you see also taking picture of the shadowed wall. So the light's reflecting off the right side against the other side. So it's kind of more even lighting seems to work best. So Here's the traditional then photo mosaicing. So we have this, sometimes we use this, this frame that's called a trenchomatic. And so this, you know, it's uh, sort of 80 centimeters by 70. But you can put the camera on the back here and it has a level. And so then this way you have constant distance against the wall. You just push it against the wall, take a picture, go down, take a picture, go down, take a picture. So it makes for really uniform photography that's easier to mosaic. So here you say one trenchomatic picture, so then you just open it in Photoshop, crop it at the grid, and then we pull it usually over to Illustrator and just place it in position. And then the next one, next one, next one. And so we can make a photo mosaic like this one. But we have to worry about working around the shores sometimes. So that's a that's a standard approach. One time, however, we use the laser scanner, so new method in the trench. And so you see this little scanner. This is this is called a uh, ZNF, so that's the name of the company. And it's an industrial scanner. It's used in factories. So if you want to laser scan some machinery, but we we rented it, and you see then we we have it just scanning. And it's a it's not a very smart scanner. It just scans 360 degrees. <laughs> It has a little camera on top. That's what this, this uh, black thing is here. And so it's taking pictures the whole time as it's scanning. So first thing you do is you can build the composite point cloud. And this is the picture of the software. And so each one of these boxes would be a position of the scanner. So we had to move it. It's very time consuming. See 12 positions for the scanner in that trench. But each time we moved it, we might set it on, like we had the boards here, so we put it on boards up here, these boards, then on the floor. So that's floor, boards, board. Uh, but each time we just run it, it runs for about one or two minutes, scans everything, 
then we have a point cloud. So move it, another point cloud, another point cloud. So in the software, then you can find those control points, these here, and you say, okay, these are common points, and it rotates and translates the clouds into the common reference frames. So you build the 3D model. And so here's another view. Then you can select a bunch of the data, which is what this yellow box is showing and project it all to make that like an ortho photo of the wall. And so here's the same place as this mosaic, but here's from the TLS with the photography. So it's pretty good, it's geometrically cleaner. And so this is also, remember yesterday I talked about structure for motion, so that would be our new approach, which might be better because it's not so time consuming as the TLS, but it may still make really good photo mosaics. Because we want the photo mosaics to document the stratigraphy and the structures. So we, we we did this as an experiment with a laser scanner, and so we say, okay, vastly improved base map, but it's expensive to have the laser scanner. You don't always have it. So the, the photo mosaic is fine. That's a standard approach, but I just wanted to show you the latest technology. And then here's the log. So this is not a, a structural site. This was a stream channel that cut down and then build up. You have the trench ready, then you do some logging. So we do detailed logging, but it depends on the scale. Sometimes 1 to 50, maybe for overview, and for very detailed logging, 1 to 5. But the scale defines the detail and also the rate of logging. So if you do 1 to 5, you're going to go a lot slower, cover the wall. And 1 to 50, maybe you go too fast and you miss detail. So usually we do some experiments. What scale is giving us the observational detail we want. We identify the major units in the structures. We ensure continuity across the site, so we make sure we're correlating our units correctly, and also between the team members. So if I'm logging and Guy actually is logging, we have to agree, okay, so this is unit 100, this is unit 200, 300, okay, where is exactly the contact? So that afterward, you don't have to spend so much time cleaning up the differences of style between the geologists for logging. We use, we draw the lines of the features, we make, make patterns, we also many notes. So as I'm logging, I may have uh, maybe 20 or 30 notes on a page, little keys, you know, one, two, three, things that are occurring to me as I'm working. I'm always looking for datable material, and, uh, and then we always do an objective mapping. We try to map just what we see rather than interpreting. And so you'll see this nomenclature in a moment. So here's our team logging so many people. So, you know, four people logging. So it's a big trench. You see it's a benched trench with a central slot. Lots of uh, shores. So this was in the days when we had some good funding so we could bring lots of people and Lots of big trenches, big shoring. So, uh, but you see the style of work. You see Sinan. So this is one of our colleagues. Uh, you see he has his music on, so he's concentrating. He has his photo mosaic here on a board, and he's just drawing. And the nice thing about the photo mosaic is he can he can just trace the units. So on one hand, you say, "Well, it's already there. What do I need to draw?" But the drawing is kind of identifying the important boundaries. And also, the, we, we map the main rocks, we watch for cracks. Here's another uh, one. This is Olaf Dilke, one of my former students. He did lots of work here, also Sinan. And then a group of students. Just, once we have all this surface area, we have to log it all. So we need help. So Because each person can log maybe two, two or three, four square meters per day at about 1 to 20, 25 scale. So... Uh, we need, we sometimes need a lot of help to, to make it happen faster. And so what we also do is we'll put the less skilled people in the easy part. So, okay, this is flat stratigraphy. All, all geology undergraduate students can easily map this. And then we put the experts in the fault zone where they need to have experience to really see carefully what's going on. So here's some more guys not working. So when I say subjective versus objective, so this is a trench log that's very interpretive. And so this is called subjective log. So 
it's just showing unit fault and uh, and and really not very much detail. And so when you look at it, you don't really have much basis to judge its quality. You just say, well, okay, it looks like this, uh, you know, fault and some colubial wedge here, some dates. So I guess I guess that's the story. But what we prefer is something like this. So this is an objective log. It's what did you see? And this provides better support for any interpretation. And so it's still interpreted, right? Because you have to decide, well, this is an important boundary and this is an important boundary. But the level of detail is much higher. And so we can support our interpretations easily. And also other geologists can make a judgment. Yeah, okay, I, I see what you're saying. This relationship is uh, supports the interpretation. Or, and you know, this is where you have to be honest. Sometimes you see something uh, that is an, alter an observation that doesn't support your main interpretation, but just put everything there, and then you interpret. So important distinction and the way that McAlpin uses the word subjective versus objective. So here's uh, some logging styles. This is our early work, 2005, from our Bedard site. So you see we were doing logging on the grid paper, and very detailed. This is a huge log here. So you see all the field, you know, we, we log on a piece of paper, and here it's just a blank grid paper. And so then with the rule, with a small tape measure, you're just measuring distance. Okay, here's the thing. Okay, another one. Just going through and measuring everything. So in some ways I like this style because I, I can I see everything. I make decisions, I draw it all. It's a little bit slow. And uh, you see we're drawing every single rock sometimes for these gravel zones, so it's quite tedious. But it works out well. So here this is uh, maybe uh, you know all the pieces of, of the field box we photocopy and then we tape them together to make kind of a mosaic. And here you can, so this is the whole trench, both walls, and then here zoom in, so you can see, for example, this fissure, but was a, a big crack that opened, and material fell in, and then it got buried. So it's an excellent piece of evidence for an earthquake. And you see another buried fissure there, a fissure here, fissure here, so this place is full of fissures. So it's great evidence for earthquakes. So when we come, when I talk about strike slip pillow seismology, interpretation, then we'll talk more about these fissures. But main point is unconformities that show cracking or folding and then no folding or cracking above. So this is a, a kind of grid paper type logging. And then here is now with the photo mosaics. We have so many photo mosaics, we put them on the wall in the motel so we can see what's going on. And uh, here is Sinan with the photo mosaic in, in the field, and you see here these strips within the color showing our interpretation at the end of what the units were. Here, again, is this, remember I showed this example around China, this trench, and here's a uh, picture just of the top of the trench, so you can see this layer comes over and it's really disrupted here, so the last earthquake comes probably just to the surface, it's not even buried. Uh, but there are some deeper deformation zones that seem to be buried by subsequent sedimentation. So maybe this is an older earthquake level here. So here's the objective log of that trench, a piece of it. So we're just looking at this, this zone here. There was that plant. Remember this guy? And then this fault comes up from down here. So because we were working, we were camping, we didn't have easy access printers and things like that. So we did old style grid paper logging, made this objective log, and then we put tracing paper over it and we make the interpretation. So main thing was we identified this this uh, layer here, which one was this? Yeah, this layer here is a prominent hard silt and it was pretty obvious to see it. So that was my main marker. And then from there, I could see these important unconformities that seem to indicate earthquake levels. And so here's notes on the overlay. So this is where I'm trying to now make my interpretation. But 
you know, I can give this to another geologist and you can make your interpretation and that's, that would be fine. And so I'm separating my observations from my interpretation as best as possible, literally on two different pieces of paper. Okay, so that's what we mean by objective, subjective. Yes, yeah, really good question. So here, what you're talking about, we have one wall that's the high wall above the bench and then the deep wall below the bench. And so they're obviously separated by two meters. So we log this one and we log that one separately. But then when we present it, usually it's presented as a single log, but there'll be some line that says bench level. And so it disrupts the layering sometimes, uh, but we present them as a single, single log. So here, uh, this is a little bit difficult to see. So you see the tr many benches. So here you can see each one of the bench lines. Those are the benches. And so, so this, these, some of these steps here are the unnatural, just trace across the bench to the next level. Trench party. So usually towards the end of the field season, you invite all the colleagues that can come and you say, we need you to come, visit our site. And, uh, you know, they can come anytime, but we usually try to make one day that's the official trench party day. And so the, you, you then discuss with everyone, okay, what are the research questions? Why are we here? What motivated this? And review the overall stratigraphy, structures, geomorphology. And then we discuss and peer review. So I present my interpretation and then you say, oh, I think I agree. Or, you know, what about this? Uh, I disagree. I, I think it's ambiguous, you know, if you challenge each other to make it as strong as possible. And then uh, it, it's, the, the reason is we want to have the colleagues there to see it. Because usually when you're done, you can fill it back in. So no one can see it again. And so then if no one has really discussed it with you in the field, there's no collective memory, there's no community consensus on what was there and what was seen. So we always have a trench party. You see here discussion in the trench, uh, you know, what's going on and sometimes some teaching. You know, some guys may have seen this somewhere else and they say, oh yeah, here, I, I saw this before, let me tell you about it. Or, oh, that's new, I never saw that before. As well as, okay, I see what you're saying, I agree. Or, I don't see it, I think it's uh, not supported. You may still make the argument, but that at least somebody presented a critique. And then here's some more people discussing, you know, uh, interpreting. You see also for safety, the helmets, because the rocks fall sometimes on your head. So then at the end, we present the trench logs and the event evidence. And so usually what happens is you compile the logs, you, and you digitize them. We correlate the units, describe the units, tabulate all the event evidence with the quality ratings from all portions of all exposures, and we present the interpretations and an alternative, and we take care of the geochronology, so we need to date the layers. So here's an example of a final log. So this log, I think, is, I think is the same one as Sinan had by him, so for a similar one. So this log ends up, there's the field, here it is when it goes to be published. So what you see is the grid. You see all the colors show the correlated units. We agree these are the layers. And because this is strike slip fault, there's material moving in and out of the plane. So that's why, for example, these layers, we don't find them over on this side because they're offset. They're old enough that they may have been deposited when they were 100 meters Part, and then they're you know, brought together by the faulting. So you see all the fractures, the fissures, and so then just one piece of one. Oh, here another one, just because this one has a bench in it also. See this bench right there? So here it was so uh, careful, so easy. We did so much detail. We, could, we don't see many disruptions across the bench, but it's there, this line. The bench. So this actually is from one of those deep ones, that one where the students were sitting all together for today. 
So here is a zoom then of just one fault zone. So this would be from from right in here. And so we show all the evidence. So we have these earthquakes, letters A through F, and then we 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 have short names for the evidence. So the so uh, usually I start at the bottom. So earthquake F, you see this. And you see the numbering, the one thing I didn't mention before I talk about the earthquake evidence is the stratigraphy just numbered instead of named. So we, and we use, uh, by 10 because sometimes you need to put a layer between two layers. And so you'd say 10, 20, 30, and then later on you might say, oh, we found 25 it's between 20 and 30 somewhere else. So it's easy to have a simple nomenclature. And in this case, the, uh, the lower numbers are younger in the stratigraphy overall. So we, you see we go from 30 to 280. So 30, so there must be some number 10 and 20 somewhere else. So anyway, the event F is between in layers 230 and 220 and it has an angular unconformity. So if you look at basically, um, 210 is a lot thicker here than here, so it shows this vertical offset difference. And then E, so E is between 150 and 180, and this MT means mole track, so that's just the name for a, a blocks that are propped up. So the mole is like a small animal. It goes through the ground and it may displace the, the ground above it. So this, you see here where 180 is broken, but then 150 is sedimented across and burying that crack. So that's the event E evidence from this site. And then we can look at D is this vertical offset unconformity. The top of 140 is buried by 120 and this 100 here. And then C is a uh, fissure. So this crack opened up and uh, offset the the one the 70 units, and then the 70 fell into the fissure. And then B is uh, another this fissure opened, and the num unit 50 fell into the top of the fissure. And also this unit 50 is tilted. And then finally the last earthquake is A, and A ruptured above 30. And you see it, it has a vertical offset of the, the 30 to maybe 20. And it, it, uh, it opened that fissure. So any one place you could say, well, okay, I see this, but why we dig so many trenches is we can find the evidence in many places. And so we accumulate the evidence and we can say, well, you know, this earthquake, let's say earthquake, um, E, has many evidences, might have 10 pieces of evidence in different parts of the trench because it correlates the stratigraphy all the way around. And so we can give it a high confidence. But we might say, well, event D is uh, pretty weak. We, we only see it in one place and it's a little bit ambiguous. So we could say it's a poor event. So we accumulate this evidence and then we present it. So when I, when we do strikes of Taylor size module, we'll revisit this log, but this is why we log is to make this interpretation. Feature or fissure? Fissure. So fissure, um, let me show you what I mean by a fissure. So let's go, remember Landers. So this was an earthquake and these pictures were the day after the earthquake. So this hole is a fissure. So the hole, what's going to happen, the material's going to fall in, right? And it's going to fill up with time. So if I dig across it, then I may see a V-shaped, that hole. And it will have, you know, the stratigraphy, the layers will come in on either side and they'll stop against the wall of the fissure. And I can see the material at the surface, like these rocks will fall in. And they will fill the fissure up. And so the fissure is an excellent piece of evidence for the earthquake. Because it, you know, shows big ground rupture, cracks opened up. So that's one example. So that's a fissure. Here would be a vertical offset or a mole track, but really vertical offset. So you see this layer comes in, steps up to here, and then goes out. 
So now if I bury that, I will see the set in the, the subsurface. Uh, here is maybe more of a mole track, so it's kind of the same, but you see this mound along the fault zone. But also angular unconformity, you see these plates, the ground was kind of a planar and it's not tilted like this. So if I bury it, I'll see that unconformity. So this is one reason why we have to go to describe earthquakes that happen immediately so we can build our understanding of the, these original forms. And then, now if we go to the, so now hopefully you can see, oh yeah, so here's that mole track. That uh, tilted block that was buried. And then here's this hole that opened up. That's one event fissure that's coming up to the bottom of 50. So maybe it's uh, actually would be an earthquake between V and C in this interpretation. 